The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Hello and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley, and with me tonight is Father William Jenkins. He's a member of the Society of St. Pius V. He's also the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church right here in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you? Very fine, Tom. Thank you. How are you doing? Doing well, Father. Thanks for being here. Good, sir. Father, we have uh, at last reached the conclusion of the Amazon Synod, which has been taking place over the course of the last month in Rome. And there's so much, uh, so much to cover here, Father. You mentioned in your sermon on Sunday that uh, with all the events that are currently taking place, you believe that we are perhaps in the time of the great apostasy. Uh, so, Father, could you give us a, a final update on this, this Amazon Synod? Where are we at now? Where do we go from here? Well, Tom, I did say in a sermon on Sunday, that's the Feast of the Kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ, that I thought we were in the time of the uh, the great apostasy, right? Um, it will take a while, right? It's not a single event that uh, comes and goes in a day. Uh, and actually, I'm just echoing the voice of St. Pius X himself. In 1903, when he issues in his first encyclical, I think it was October 4th, that he issued his first encyclical in 1903, just a couple of months after he was elected the Pope, he talked about how terrified he was to become the Pope because he believed that we were in the times described by St. Paul in uh, Saint, uh, in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. That is where St. Paul describes the coming of the Antichrist. And uh, Pope St. Pius X mentioned quite explicitly he thought that we might be in those times and uh, that the Antichrist might be already in the world or soon to come. So, um, you know, my, my opinion matters little, but his opinion matters very much. And that was over 100 years ago. And that was well over 100 years ago now. But he saw the signs of it, and he recognized them. So, and one could see why he would be terrified at the thought of becoming a pope and yeah. uh, the victory of Christ on earth at a time like that. You know? So... Um, the the Amazonian Synod, or the, the there are so many different titles of the Synod for the Pan Amazon region, and, and so on. And the um, the Synod has uh, come and gone, you might say, but it's not really concluded. It's just beginning, you might say. Okay, <clears throat> uh, the real work of that Synod uh, was predetermined in the, in the uh, Instrumentum Laboris the famous working document that they put in front of all the participants, uh, it was pretty ill spelled out what the Senate was going to do. I guess we were somewhat holding our breath to determine whether or not they would lose their nerve mm -hmm. in putting in these radical, radical developments. I, I thought that it would follow, I thought the Senate would follow a certain pattern, that is that they throw out some something really radical and then enact something that was less radical okay but it was still radical but then at the end everyone would say oh thank goodness we dodged the bullet they didn't take this to its uh its full extent you know they weren't as radical as they might have been and this is typical procedure for modernists you know to to move things along this is typical procedure for leftists right we're making it worse, but not nearly as bad as you might have been afraid of, you know, as we threatened to. And so, accept this, be at peace with it, get used to it, because there's another step coming soon. But, in fact, the Amazon Synod was as radical as the working document made it out to be. Not only because the, close, the final document, which came out, there was a great deal of controversy as to who would be authoring that document. And to this day, I'm not sure they have uh, answered the question, who's actually composing this final document. But it did come out in favor of a married clergy, a married priest in the Amazon, 
region, which is, you know, good for... The, they say it's going to apply to the Novus Ordo Church throughout the world. The German uh, Episcop is, is already saying they're going to kind of take their own way in this and uh, kind of expand upon the Amazon Synod and, and uh, make of it what they want. But they've been radical for so long, nobody's surprised at that anyway. But, I mean, the, the modernists have been attacking the priesthood all along anyway. I mean, it was the very first sacrament that they attacked back in 1968, first one they changed. So uh, they've been undermining the whole idea of, of a real, of any Catholic priesthood for a long time. So, you know, uh, when one day um, at ordinations in uh, Ridgefield, Connecticut, uh, as we were in procession for the ordination mass, we had a group of radical women there in, in shorts and, uh, and t-shirts holding signs demanding the priesthood. But when they saw the traditional priesthood, <clears throat> they packed up their signs and left. That's not what they had in mind. They were looking for the Novus Ordo priesthood, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which is not the traditional Catholic priesthood by any means. Okay? So when we read about the Amazon Synod talking about married priests, uh, we have to realize they're not talking about the Catholic priesthood. They're talking about the Novus Ordo priesthood which is something radically different. They're trying to replace the Catholic priesthood entirely, but they've been working at this now for a long, long time. Uh, they're following in the footsteps, basically, of the Anglicans long ago and the Protestants before them. So, in any case, um, they also left the door wide open for uh, uh, women ministries. And... Uh, Finally, I mean, they're talking about the diaconate. They're talking openly about making women deacons. And one cardinal, in fact, is saying, well, if we're going to make women deacons, we should make them cardinals too. Because if we make them deacons, but not let them be cardinals, they're going to leave the church. Well, I've got news for you. They've already left the church a long time ago. So uh, the Catholic church, the true Catholic church anyway. So they're still pretending that all of this is Catholic. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the real point of all of this and having the so-called married uh, clergy in the Amazon, married priests, so-called, and having female ministers is so that they can bring in this Amazonian rite. They want the Amazonian spirituality. They want the pagan uh, theology. They want the pagan rituals brought in. And they're relying on the older married men, the shamans, like the grandfathers, and the women, who they say in the working document are the ones who teach the children the songs about Bashamama and all the rest. So they bring in the lore of their ancestors, pagan ancestors, and they teach this to the children. That's why they want them to be the ministers of their new pan-Amazonian religion. Um, in uh, following upon this, this synod here. And they want that to be a model as to what they're going to do to their church throughout the entire world. That's the new order. Right? Uh, they also um, brought a number of other changes in. Uh, they, they talk about an Amazonian rite. So they're going to bring in a new rite of the liturgy, mm -hmm. their liturgy, in which they're going to cel celebrate the, the Amazon. They're going to celebrate the Amazonian indigenous uh, deities and spirits. That's what they intend to do. Pashyamama is just one of them, okay? And um, the, um, there was uh, something that came out about the, the idols being thrown into the Tiber River and then retrieved and the Italian police uh, returning them, restoring them to Francis. And he made some kind of uh, uh, vague threat about marching into uh, St. Peter's with them. But I understand, actually, those idols had already made the journey into St. Peter's. After the, uh, after the idolatrous worship of the idols in the gardens of the Vatican, on October 4th, I understand that those very idols were carried into St. Peter's and before the Baldacchino of, Saint, of uh, Bernini, and right there in front of the high altar at St. Peter's, they had an idolatrous worship ceremony. Again, singing and chanting and carrying on and holding up these idolatrous images um, as some kind of a, an idol. And then uh, they, they did wind up in the church of Santa Maria and Transpontina, as you know, from which they were taken to be thrown in, in, the, in the Tiber. 
So uh, when Francis said, we have the idols back, I apologize. As the Bishop of Rome, I apologize. And uh, he then made a veiled threat to bring them into St. Peter's for the closing liturgy mm -hmm. on Sunday, right. which is really the Feast of Christ the King. That was the, the date of that great feast day. And he was threatening to, to do that. <clears throat> but uh, the press uh, made note of the fact that the idols were not in evidence on last Sunday. October 28th. 27. 27th, thank you. And um, that's right. And, but as it turns out, it has also been made known that uh, Pashamama was not only honored by another symbol, not those, you know, she has other symbols like the snake, the serpent, and so on. But there was a woman who actually uh, conducted this up the aisle at the offertory procession, right? The offering of the gifts and so on. A potted plant. And the uh, story is that <clears throat> it is uh, a part of the lore of the Amazon region that you can honor Pashamama by uh, taking a potted plant actually or even, you know, just a plant in the ground anywhere, soil, and, and press your thumb into the soil to make an indentation. And pour in a kind of libation, like the pagans used to worship to their gods and goddesses. Pour into the whole libation of things that you're going to be eating or drinking. But you also share that with Pashamama as a means of uh, pacifying her, appealing to Pashamama as the earth goddess. <clears throat> and this is one way of making an offering. Well, the story is that... Um, that this potted plant was carried in precisely to represent that, that offering to Pashamama there in that form. And it was placed on the very, the very uh, principal altar at St. Peter's, wow. right, over the, uh, <clears throat> right over the remains of St. Peter himself, down in the necropolis there, the excavations. That would be, again, an enormous sacrilege for that to be done. By the way, you know, somebody suggested to me that well, you know, what they're doing to our country is similar to what they're doing to our church. <clears throat> we see as traditional Catholics our church uh, <clears throat> being um, dismantled, as it were, uh, the faith being dismantled in the hearts of the Catholic people by the, the modernists. And they're trying to falsify our faith entirely. They're trying to put a, an imposter church, an imposter religion in its place, modernism. And we're also being told that you look at what's happening in Washington, D.C., <clears throat> they're trying to destroy the Constitution to do away with it and simply replace it with, with kind of mob rule in, in the Congress, okay? Uh, Congress run by the Democrats, they just want to kind of make it up as they go along. We see this with the uh, so-called impeachment proceedings and all, so many other things that they do. So somebody suggested that <clears throat> we have the Pashamama in, uh, in the Vatican but we have the Pash Obama in Congress, which would be the mother earth fertility goddess uh, Nancy Pelosi, right? But it, it's, I thought, no, that doesn't really work because Nancy Pelosi is so in favor of abortion and she's so much the point person in Washington for abortion that she's more of the infertility goddess in Washington. And this is what we're dealing with there. Sure. But then it occurred to me that actually Pashamama, even though she's referred to as the mother, earth mother, mother earth goddess and so on, uh, she's also in need of appeasement as a pagan idol would need to be appeased. And they're appeased by blood. And the blood is that of children. And so we know that there uh, throughout history have been untold numbers of children's sacrificed. That is to say, sacrificed to death. I mean, they were killed to appease pa Pashamama. We have uh, records of uh, mass sacrificial offerings of the lives of children um, offered in a very distinct way, which indicates that they were offerings to this Pashamama devil, this demon, in order to pacify her or it. <clears throat> it reminds us of what St. Paul says, that the gods of the Gentiles are devils. I believe that's in the Psalms too, if I'm not mistaken. But this is what we're dealing with here. When we're talking about an idol to Bashamaba, we're dealing with an actual devil. 
uh, which uh, can be appeased by human blood and human sacrifice, according to the lore of the pagans. And this is what they offer. So to see Pashamama being uh, carried into the Vatican, an actual demon, and uh, for whom thousands, perhaps tens of thousands in the course of the years, of uh, children have been, have been struck to death, uh, cruelly, viciously put to death, to appease this bloodthirsty devil. And to have uh, Pasha Obama in the, uh, in the White House with uh, millions and millions of children aborted. There's a correspondence there, there's no doubt about it. What we're witnessing now is that paganism even worse than uh, the paganism of old because it represents a, an explicit rejection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. To think of all of this going on on the feast of the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ is uh, makes us very, very sad, but it also makes us very determined to offer it to the true God our, our sacrifice of love to him, our allegiance and our determination uh, not to allow these outrages to pass without reparation to him and a determination that we are going to live lives uh, according to his law and to, to serve him, be faithful to him, and to absolutely oppose this uh, modernist paganization. And Father, with all of these outrages that are taking place, have you seen any sort of uh, reaction or response from the Novus Ordo Catholic people? Uh, do you expect to see any response from them if all of these things come to fruition? You know, you mentioned the, uh, the idea of the standard operating procedure of the leftists where they will throw out something extremely radical and then embrace something that's a little less radical. You know, there's the, uh, the famous saying that uh, today's, today's uh, conservatives are yesterday's liberals. Yeah. And that, that seems to be very true where in the Novus Ordo, you know, we've been seeing this play out for decades where the Novus Ordo people will say, uh, you know, I, I'll leave the Novus Ordo church when they have communion in the hand. And then that came, that came about. Now they say, well, I'll leave the Novus Ordo church when we have mm -hmm. uh, women priestesses in our, in our churches. So do you expect to see any kind of response from all this? Have you seen any kind of response yet? What, what do you expect? Well, the response is, is a lot of hand-wringing. And there are those who are in desperation. They're trying to explain to themselves uh, it, what seems to be a contradiction. It's, it's something of dilemma. I mean, how can a pope do these terrible things, you know? Well, that's a very important question with a very, very important answer. And the answer would be, well, you know, if, if a pope does these terrible things, then he would be a heretic or an apostate, and he would therefore lose the office, if he ever had the office. If he, in fact, ever was a vicar of Christ on earth, if he ever was a successor of St. Peter and so on, he would lose that because in the eyes of the church he would have died spiritually died. And in losing the faith, it would be as though he had he, uh, simply lost his life. One could use an argument about abdication, but there is a difference of opinion in the, among the theologians of the past as to whether or not it would simply take a matter of recognizing the fact or actually having uh, members of the hierarchy who were still Catholic get together and acknowledge it and, and proclaim it to be the fact that he had lost the faith, had defected from the faith, and therefore had, you know, basically died in the eyes of the church and lost the papacy for that death. So they're, they're, they're trying to argue this all out among themselves, and there's a lot of heated rhetoric. Mm -hmm. And um, it, um, it surprises me, though, because there, there's so much false information going on around there. There are those who say, uh, yes, he is a heretic, but no, there's nothing we can do about it because it doesn't affect his being the pope. Mm -hmm. Now, that is not the traditional teaching of theologians, uh, the proved theologians by the church at all. That's not a, that's, that is actually not a tenable position for a Catholic to have, as far as I know. There's, I don't think there's any precedence uh, uh, among uh, Catholic theologians of the past who actually have said, said that, okay? Uh, there are plenty who have said that if a pope were to lose the faith, that he would lose, it, he would no longer be pope. He could not be the pope because he wouldn't be a member of the church. He would have publicly defected from the, the body of Christ. But uh, I think part of the problem is they're afraid. I think they're afraid, like, what happens then? Mm -hmm. They don't know what's going to happen then. If we actually face the fact that Francis has lost the faith and has publicly rejected the faith, 
then uh, then there are serious decisions that have to be made. Now, I've been just telling them all <laughs> through all these broadcasts that no matter what else one may think about all these matters, <clears throat> one still has to return to the practice of the traditional Catholic faith, no matter what. That that's that's a, that's a given. That's the baseline. We have to give up the Novus Ordo, the new order. We have to give up Vatican II and all that came out of it, uh, with all of the modernism and all the modernist principles that it that it that it sowed and the confusion that it sowed in the minds of the Catholic people. We have to t reject that as one big, huge modernist construct, and uh, see that what's happening now is simply a, a, a new phase of what began before then, uh, that began in the run-up to Vatican II and then, and then followed from it, and um, realize it's all of a piece. It's all one thing, based on the same principles all the way through. And those principles of Vatican II are what we must reject. <laughs> That means we have to go back to practicing the traditional faith with real traditional Catholic priests mm. who not only have the traditional Catholic faith themselves, but have been ordained traditional Catholic by traditional Catholic bishops and still hold firmly and exclusively to the traditional Catholic religion. And Father, I thought it was interesting that uh, you used the, the word afraid because I actually just, just saw the headline of an article, uh, I believe it was just yesterday, uh, where this, uh, I forget the, the exact website, but it said that uh, many bishops and many people in the church actually do disagree with Francis and, and what he's done, but they are, quote, afraid to speak out. And I think that that really uh, hits the nail on the head, and I think that doesn't that even applies to the Novus Ordo Catholic people as well, um, where they, they, they may totally see what's going on and detest the, the way... Many of them are horrified. They don't, they're scared. They don't know what to do. Well, you know, they're afraid also to recognize that it is the development of Vatican II. They're afraid to see the origins of Francis, that the egg from which he was hatched is Vatican II. They're afraid to recognize that because they would have to actually retrace their steps and reject the entire monstrosity of Vatican II and all the evil that it's, that it's spawned. They have to reject the whole thing. And they're afraid to do that. In some cases, some of these people uh, were born during or after Vatican II, and this is all they've actually known. Right. And so uh, for them, the traditional Catholic faith and traditional Catholic religion are kind of terra in, incognita. They're, they're not incognita. They're, total, they're not known to these people. They're familiar with it. But they, they can become so, and this is what they really need to do. Once they realize they're on the wrong track, and if anything, Francis has shown them that they're definitely on the wrong track, <laughs> then they need to uh, find the haven back in the traditional Catholic faith and the practice of the traditional Catholic religion. They can't be afraid to acknowledge the truth. Uh, Walter Matt does make that point, that Vatican II spawned all of this evil. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Michael Matt. Michael Matt. Michael Matt. Walter, <laughs> see, I'm living back in the past here. I'm revealing my age here, but, uh, you know. Michael. So the, the wonder and uh, the, 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 what you might call the good old days, I guess. But, uh, like a tradition. But, uh, yeah, really. <laughs> but uh, Michael Matt uh, st does make that point, and I give him credit for that. He's the one who also says we've got to unite the clans. Mm -hmm. And his idea, I think, is to uh, bring everyone together in the, the traditional mass and traditional sacraments and re you know, to return to the traditional practice of the, tr of the traditional Catholic religion. But I, I think that we have to realize uh, that uniting the clans has to be the work of God. So the so-called sure. uniting of the clans. How do you so-called unite the clans when so many of them want to cling to Vatican II? Mm -hmm. And look at that, and consider Benedict XVI to be the great traditionalist. Mm -hmm. And he's not, okay? He was very much a part of the Vatican II revolution uh, from the beginning yes. uh, until the day he died. He was very much a part of the Vatican II revolution. As you say, he was one of those who was yesterday's conservative, a liberal who became a present day's conservative, just by contrast. So you can't really unite the clans except around uh, true principles, and those principles have to be a rejection of the Vatican II principles. They have to be true Catholic principles. The point being, Tom, that only God by grace can do that. Sure. And Father, just since you mentioned Michael Matt, I thought it was fascinating. Just recently, a, a friend sent me a link to a, a video of Michael Matt's where 
someone had asked him the question concerning the Amazon Synod of, uh, you know, what is going to happen if if all of this of the uh, the Amazon Synod and, and the goals that they propose if they actually come to fruition, they actually happen, and all this. What will you do? What will you leave the church? What's going to happen? And Michael, Matt, his response was, I don't believe that they're going to be able to pull this off. And um, just just hearing that is um, it just amazed me to to think that. They're not going to be able to pull this off. They've already pulled it off. There, there, right, there, right. there is, there, there, there's no semblance of Catholicism left. I don't his, know what he means by that, actually. I, th- I think he means that they're not going to be able to actually impose all of these incredibly radical forms, uh, reforms uh, that that they propose. Uh, he, he doesn't think that they're actually going to come to fruition. And Maybe actually, he thinks that God is going to intervene and stop. It's God's church. Okay, he's, there's he's so going, many people who say to that. As though it absolves us of responsibility to. So we can just sit back and watch the the, the wreckage right? yeah. and the souls being yeah. lost by this. Yeah. Um, well, I dare say, you know, that they're exalting the Maccabees now, but the Maccabees did not just sit back and say, well, God isn't going to let this happen. <laughs> um, they took very decisive action about this to defend their faith, mm-hmm. and um, which at that time was the true faith, no doubt about it. Sure. So, um, yes, well, as I, as I mentioned, the reaction that I've seen is a lot of hand wringing. Mm-hmm. And um, who was it? Uh, I think uh, Monsignor Pope in um, in Washington D.C. says we've got to pray that there'll be this return to humane vitae, and Francis will come around and 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 um, you know come out with his allegiance to humane vitae. And so we've got to pray for that. Okay. And then somebody else is saying, "Oh, I think we're already past the humane vitae moment." You know, and. <laughs> And then um, other, others are, are saying we've got to pray that God does this and that God does that. <clears throat> but I, I imagine there were, at the time of the Maccabees, uh, many, many Jews who were faithful, who just said, well, you know, we, we have to hope that God intervenes, you know, and stops all these pagans from, um, you know, uh, uh, sub- subjecting our land to their paganism and putting out their pagan altars and offering pagan sacrifice in our land and so on. I'm, I'm sure, but there was only one family that we know of that rose up to begin to oppose this decisively, and those are the Maccabees. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, I consider Monsieur Lefebvre to be one of the Maccabees, or in the spirit of the Maccabees, to stand up and say no. Um, <clears throat> but instead of, uh, like, like Satan, who stands up and is saying, I will not serve God, he was saying, I will not serve Satan and all of his pomps and all of his, uh, you know, and all of his uh, lies and so on. I will not, I will not allow the modernists to, to do this, uh, to lay waste the church. And um, by the grace of God, he was able to, to um, bring about, uh, you know, uh, rarely the traditional Catholics, you mm-hmm. know, just by a very strong voice, condemning modernism. I would that the modern society of St. Pius X um, would do that now. Would that they would do that. Well, Father, since you mentioned them, final point on this Amazon Senate to wrap all of this up, what, what do you make of this uh, this letter that was sent out just yesterday, I believe, uh, October 28th, the Feast of St. Simon and Jude the Apostles? This is from uh, Superior General Father Davide Pagliarani, where he... Uh, he kind of laments all of the uh, the terrible abominations and idolatrous rites that uh, have been played out in the sanctuary of God, he says. Um, but in, in response to all of these events, he writes here just a, a quote, We call on all members of the society, including third order members, to observe a day of prayer and reparation because we cannot remain indifferent to such attacks on the holiness of Holy Mother the Church. We ask that a fast be observed in all our houses on Saturday, November 9th. We invite all the faithful to the same, and we also encourage children to offer prayers and sacrifices. On Sunday, November 10th, 2019, each priest of the society will celebrate a Mass of Reparation, and in each chapel, the litanies of the saints taken from the liturgy of the Rotogations will be sung or recited to ask God to protect His Church and to spare it from the punishments that such acts cannot fail to draw down upon it. We urge all priests, friends, as well as all Catholics who love the Church to do the same. Such is the due honor to the honor of the Holy Roman Catholic Church, founded by our Lord Jesus Christ, which is neither idolatrous nor pantheistic. And again, that's signed by Father Davide Pagliarani, the Superior General of the Society of St. Pius X. What, what do you think of that, Father? Well, in itself, I think it's a very good thing. 
I mean, uh, calling obviously for prayer, mm -hmm. fasting, and holy masses to be offered, right? Um, this is an internal letter, though, the Society of St. Pius X. It's addressed to members of the Society. Yes. This is not what I've been hoping for. I mean, I was, I was, not that, not that I'm against what is, what is called for here, okay? I think that's, that's very good and very important insofar as it goes. But, you know, I think we're all looking uh, at the Society of St. Pius X now to fill the role that Archbishop Lefebvre himself filled. Yeah. Now that's unrealistic because Archbishop Lefebvre was a unique individual with uh, tremendous gifts and great, great, great faith. And uh, I don't know of anybody on the face of the earth who is another Archbishop Marcelifa right now. So I'm not expecting Father Pagliarani or Bishop Fillet or anyone to take Monsieur Lefebvre's place, okay? <clears throat> but I, I would say this, I mean, I, you know, Archbishop Lefebvre was that resounding voice, not just within the society, but he was the resounding voice that went to all the world. He spoke openly to all of the world about these things. He doesn't just put out a, a newsletter, as it were, to the members of the society about these things, addressing them like in a kind of a Indian house thing. He actually spoke very boldly for the faith and against error, against heresy, against idolatry, against sacrilege, against blasphemy. He condemned these things before the whole world. And uh, so that's, that's what is necessary right now, I think. Um, and, you know, I don't think it's unreasonable to expect that that's what Monsignor Lefebvre himself would want of the society that he established that it continue his work um, kind of condemning modernism and all of its works and all of its pomps throughout the entire world. This is t truly uh, something satanic that we are facing right now. And uh, even when Monsieur Lefebvre was engaged in trying to work out a, a protocol arrangement with the Vatican, when there was attack on the faith, he was not silent. He would not sacrifice um, the integrity of the faith or let the, our Lord be insulted or offended uh, for the sake of diplomacy. Okay? He was, he was a trained member of the Vatican Diplomatic Corps, and he knew diplomacy very well. But he would never, ever allow diplomacy that is human interests <coughs> to silence him when it came to defending the faith. And he, um, he was very, very outspoken, very bold before the whole world about this. He thought it was his, his, his mission, his purpose, his, his vocation, you know. Um, and so it was. We don't, see, we don't hear that. We do not hear that, that leadership now. Um, and again, I mean, I, I, I'm, glad, I'm glad the Society of St. Pius X is, is doing this. Um, I'm glad they recognize what they call here, uh, idolatry and pantheism being promoted in the Vatican. But uh, I, I would, I hear, I hear Novus Ordo, conservative Novus Ordo voices raised to condemn this. In no uncertain terms, <clears throat> and with the voices that are actually carrying around the world, and um, that is one area where the Society of Saint Pius X seems to just be uh, almost uh, deafeningly silent in terms of that voice to resound through the world, condemning these evils, rallying the troops. You know. Um, I think it was Monsieur Lefebvre who really uh, initially wanted to try to unite the clans, as it were, right? But the Society of St. Pius X is, is take, not only taking a back seat to that, and kind of ceding that role to a, Walter, uh, to a Michael Matt to call for that, um, but it's not even on the, on, the, on the bus, you know? I mean, when there were 
conservative Nova Serbo voices that's even signed a letter to all the Nova Serbo bishops saying Francis is a heretic, you need to acknowledge that. The voice of the Society of St. Pius X was raised to disapprove of that letter, that accusation against Francis, and to actually, um, well, I, I think one took that the way it was, uh, at its face value, as a defense of Francis, that you can't blame him. Um, and uh, this is disrespectful for you to accuse him of this. So what is this ambivalence we're seeing here? Uh, people will not rally to an uncertain trumpet. I guess I'd put it that way. I guess, uh, you know, with all of this, I guess I would say the SSPX is that uncertain trumpet now, and people are not going to rally to that. They shouldn't. We we'll need the clarion uh, voice of Monsignor Lefebvre again, and that's, it's not the SSPX. Father, I'd like to change gears and spend a little bit of time on another topic, if you're up for it, for this I, the, the I hope so. second half of the program. Uh, we, we received a, a couple emails over the previous months concerning this topic of Catholic dating. Mm -hmm. And we have a, a few particular questions in regards to this topic, Father. But uh, just in general, how should single Catholics go about dating today? How should they approach dating and, and finding a spouse? What kind of mindset should they have? What kind of things should they be looking for? Well, Tom, it's not really so much of a change of topic, frankly. And I'll tell you why, because, again, the modern mentality uh, is that dating is primarily for fun. And there's those who say, there are still those who say, well, I'm dating because I'm looking for a spouse, okay? But unfortunately, too many of them, when they say, I'm dating to find a spouse, think of it that way, though. They think of, I'm thinking of a spouse with whom I can have fun, with whom I can enjoy life. And I want to find somebody with whom I can enjoy life, and I'm looking for someone who I can fall madly in love with because they have a great sense of humor, they're this, they're that, they have all these qualities. And uh, for a traditional Catholic, though, what we're looking at is finding someone with whom to find, find our vocation pursue our calling from God, and that calling from God in the married state is to be a husband, a wife, a mother, a father. And so what, we, what, what our young people need to be looking for when they are looking for a spouse and therefore <clears throat> dating with that, that in mind, they should be looking for someone whom they can truly love and respect and admire so much that they would want this man to be the father of their children and this woman to be the mother of their children. <clears throat> in choosing someone like that, it's not just a matter of finding someone we can have fun with, someone who can be a bowling buddy with me or whatever, but it has to do with the, who they are, you know, the, 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 the character that they have, the virtues that they have in their souls. You see, <clears throat> When, when a young man and a young woman are, are dating, they have to prove something. They have to prove something to each other. They have to prove something to themselves. Uh, I won't go so far as to say they have to prove something to God. But they should look upon the dating uh, process as not only an opportunity to discover about somebody else, their goodness, their weaknesses, but it's, it's important that they discover about themselves who they are. You see, for a boy... To become a man, he has to fight the battle against impurity. He has to fight the battle against his own um, <clears throat> lustfulness, okay? And uh, he can only really uh, achieve manhood by dealing with that. In the old days, when I said the, the, the knights of old, the olden days, the dragon represented that. The dragon represented the vice of lust. The fire-breathing dragon represented the, the vice of lust. And what would the young knight do? He would go out valiantly to win his, his, to the fair damsel in distress, his bride. He would, he would win her by fighting the dragon and slaying the dragon. 
And it signified, it signified his overcoming of that weakness of lustfulness in him, <clears throat> that he would develop within him the virtue of purity of heart. This was the great quest. This was the great battle he had to fight to be worthy of being considered a knight, really. <clears throat> um, there's a reason why they had the Order of the Garter, you know. Um, the Order of the Garter was kind of a, an idea of that pledge that the knight has to earn that, uh, that right, I would say, to a virgin's life and her purity <clears throat> and her care. So here's a man who wants to marry a woman whom hopefully he doesn't just lust after and, and want to have fun with, but he admires her, and he respects her, he treasures her, he cherishes her, in all the sense of the word, so much that he would lay his life down for her. And yes, he could live without her, but he doesn't want to. And so he will go off and fight armies, even fire-breathing dragons, in order to win her favor, and to show her that he can be trusted, that he's a, he's a man, he's not a boy, he's a knight, He's not a serf in a sense, right? He's, he is a master of himself. And, but that's how he proves that he's a man who can be trusted with that great responsibility of having a wife and having children. He's grown up. He's gained that self-control that enables him to take responsibility for the souls of others who are going to rely on him now. Okay? We're going to rely on him to defend them, to protect them, to guide them, not only in the temporal welfare, but in the spiritual welfare too, as a head of their household. Okay? That's a tremendous responsibility. I don't know how many of our young men even come to realize that that is what is involved in all of this. It's, it's, a, it's a sacred responsibility of their vocation before God. And um, so how does a, a man prove that uh, to a woman that he can actually love her not only body but soul body and soul that he loves her as a person and he would never do anything to hurt her attack her to wound her body or soul never because he respects her as a person body and soul all too often young men today seem to forget <clears throat> that they're dealing with another person here his body and soul and they lose sight of it to the point where they, they, all they think is the body. And they don't realize that what they're doing to the body is affecting the soul. <laughs> Heaven help a woman who marries a man like that. <clears throat> Heaven help a woman who marries a boy like that. <clears throat> who forgets that she's a person with a soul. Just because of his own lustful desires. He takes advantage of a situation... Can he be trusted then, not only with this woman placing herself, body and soul, in his hands, in his, uh, you might say, in his power, because, let's face it, when you marry someone, you give them power over your body and soul. You really do. And um, when you love someone, you give them great power to make you happy, but you also give them great power to hurt you in the way no one else can hurt you. <clears throat> and the salvation or damnation of souls also, also so often comes down to a question of whom do you love or think you love and whom do you marry because of the power and the influence they have over your soul. And a woman, who may, would she marry a man she can't even trust with her own soul? Why would she entrust the souls of her children to a man like that? So a woman may think she has to win the man she, she wants to they think she wants to marry, by giving into his lustfulness, by placating that demon in him. But that's a tragic mistake because, again, that is not real love there. And uh, she is proving that she's not really a woman. She's just a girl. And that's the problem we have these days. Too many boys are marrying girls, and girls are marrying boys. They're not grown up. They don't even have the self-control to be responsible for themselves, let alone for other souls too. So I would say when a man is dating, when a woman is dating, let's show, show their manhood 
and their womanhood, that they are adults by showing that self-control they have. This is the proving ground. This is where they show that they are worthy of the marriage vows. When they, if they're going to respect the marriage vows when they make them, if they're going to respect the marriage vows after they make them, they have to show that they respect the marriage vows before they make them, right? If they don't respect their marriage vows before they make them, they're not going to respect them when they pronounce them, and they're not going to respect them after they're married. Mm. This is one of the greatest uh, barometers, you might say, of the future, of the, like weather forecasting, as to whether or not they're going to be faithful in marriage, if they can be faithful before marriage. Father, there, there's a practical question that arises uh, before all of this, though. It kind of prefaces everything that you're talking about, and that is this question of how does a uh, how does a traditional Catholic, let's say a traditional Catholic man, how does he find a, a real traditional Catholic woman? How does a traditional Catholic woman find a real traditional Catholic man to date? Is it as simple as if, if they feel called to the married state that uh, something just kind of organically comes about? How, how much energy should they invest in seeking out a, a Catholic uh, dating partner? What do you think of the, the online dating uh, kind of uh, world? Um, so just a, a practical kind of thing, Father. How, how does one go about finding a Catholic dating partner? Well, I mean, obviously, if you're looking for a traditional Catholic spouse, there are certain places you certainly don't look, okay? Such as? Bars. Okay, okay you don't do the bar scene. There are certain areas you just don't do. You don't go looking there. For, mm -hmm. I mean, if you're looking for gold, <laughs> certain areas, you know, if you're going to want to strike oil, if you want to find something valuable and precious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, you have to uh, be very prudent in that. But you have to pray. It all starts with prayer, asking God's guidance. Without that, it cannot end well, okay? The graces need to be there. And one needs to pray not only for himself or for herself, but one needs to pray for the other person out there. Now, I don't believe there's the one, the only, okay? Okay, people think in terms of, oh, there's the one. I've got to find the one, the needle in the haystack. It's not that way. <clears throat> and not only that, it's not really a matter so much of them uh, go conducting this massive search, okay? It's, it's not a reconnaissance mission, you know? It, it's, one has to pray to God that God brings them together. Um, and so the prayers are very, are indispensable. They're essential to have all this work out and, and begin well and end well, okay? One has to pray to God for oneself and for one's eventual spouse. But, um, you know, if, if one were to uh, look for a traditional Catholic spouses, then the, the logical place would be to look in traditional Catholic chapels and to visit them, uh, to make friends. You know, I mean, a, a young woman could make, no doubt, makes young women friends in other chapels and go and visit them. And through them, who knows who they would meet, you know. Um, so I, I recommend that the young men and the young women don't just um, <clears throat> ensconce themselves in a pew uh, in, the, the, in a, the, you know, a traditional Catholic church somewhere and say, okay, I'm hoping some really, really good traditional Catholic man will come and sit down next to me and we'll hit it off. And no, I mean, there has to be some effort there, okay? But one cannot think that the entire effort depends upon me. I have to look at it this way, that I'm going to make the effort, the reasonable effort, that God will reward my efforts by going beyond them. And um, <clears throat> so it is important that one make efforts, first of all, beginning with prayer, but then I'd suggest that the young people circulate among the traditional Catholic chapels and allow themselves to be known and, and to get to know others, too. What about online dating websites? No, I was going to get to that, too. I, you know, there was a time when I was very much against that because I considered that to be... Sort of like um, trawling, you know, trawling for fish, you know. And I don't know, I didn't know <clears throat> how well that worked. But I tell you, as somebody convinced me now, we, we have a number of very nice, very good, healthy marriages that have come out of these uh, online uh, websites uh, where they are for conservative, traditional Catholics. When they say traditional these days, it, it really is a broad, broad range. <laughs> It can, mean any, it can mean anybody from just somebody who practices only the traditional Catholic religion in its entirety to somebody who's 
content just to hear somebody say Dominus Oviscum, you know, and then and then everything all is well. Or Curia Elais, and that's all they need, you know. Then that's a traditional mass as far as they're concerned, which it is not. So when you when you go through these these websites, you really have to be careful. But the benefit is that you can look at the profiles that are there and see how people answer these questions, uh, pertinent questions. And the answers might not always be spot on and, you know, mean what you think they mean or what you want them to mean. But still, you can eliminate so many people who you know, you know, do not meet your requirements. And it also makes a statement and says, this is what I'm looking for. So these are my principles. And I'm looking for somebody who corresponds to my, who has the same principles I do. And that's not a bad way to start, you know, to, to say, okay, well, I can eliminate so many because these people do not think like I do, do not value what I do, do not have the same, basically, religious principles that I do. And um, then, of, then, of course, after narrowing it down, one kind of has, a, has a, an understanding of who I'm dealing with. And uh, it's, I think it's a lot safer in that regard, too than just kind of wandering around society out there at large and trying to bump into somebody who thinks like you do. Some other true traditional Catholic soul wants to remain above all faithful to Christ who's wandering through the world seeking a, a, a worthy spouse. Um, so I, I've actually become more and more favorable as time goes on to these websites. I'm not familiar with them except from what I've been told. Mm -hmm. I've only been told this. Okay. But I, as I say, I have encountered very good people, very solid traditional Catholics who are, I, I believe a great love for God, a deep faith, a powerful hope, and a great love for God. And they found someone like them who has a deep faith, you know, hope, and a love for, for God. So I think it can happen, but I know that the success begins with the prayers. Okay, well, Father, let's say that two uh, Catholics meet each other and they begin dating. What should what should that look like? What are some practical rules for for Catholic dating? What does a Catholic courtship look like? Well, first of all, I mean, they, they have to make certain rules for themselves. The rules are actually set by the Church. And prudence, just common prudence and common decency, okay? You, <clears throat> in dating, you, you bring not only faith and hope and charity, the three supernatural virtues, but in dating, you, you very much have to bring the kind of virtues that you will need in marriage. These are the cardinal virtues, or the moral virtues, as they're called. Prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. Those virtues have to be <clears throat> like basically always kept in mind during the dating process. Uh, I mean, temperance, of course, the, restra the restraint. And so they have to use prudence in order to, to practice that restraint. They, they can't put themselves in a compromising position. <clears throat> it's a sin of uh, presumption <clears throat> for two people, two young people, to put themselves in some kind of compromising, compromising position where normally people would be tempted and even uh, gravely tempted to commit mortal sins. <clears throat> um, that they would not do that to their own souls. They would not do this to the other person any more than they would dangle them over the Niagara Falls and, and <clears throat> for fun and let's see what, what happens. You just wouldn't do that. You, know? you wouldn't marry a person who would do that <clears throat> to you or to your children. And so um, prudence has to rule. It's, it's called the auriga virtutum, the chariot driver of all the virtues. Because prudence enables us to, to know what is the right, the good end, and how to achieve it, okay? And so uh, in pursuing temperance, that's self-control and moderation, right? Against lust and against gluttony and all the rest, the satisfaction and the drive for pleasure, prudence has to dictate to two people uh, where they're going to be, when they're going to be there, in whose company they're going to be, what kind of things they're going to watch, <clears throat> the, the activities they're going to do together, generally. Uh, <clears throat> it would tell them, look, uh, you know, 
there, there's an attraction here, and we are human, and we have to humbly acknowledge that fact. We can't presume uh, that we are uh, beyond being tempted like this. That's presumption. And so there are certain parameters we have to we have to respect. We can't be sitting on the couch together in the love seat together, watching some kind of romantic movie late at night. You know, and, uh, mm -hmm. we, we can't do that. It's not right. You know, I don't care whether we're seventeen or twenty-seven years old. I mean, it's it's <clears throat> it's it's uh, putting each other and putting ourselves in danger. Things like that. They have to respect that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, so, if there's something that is inappropriate, that right there is where they should stop. They should ask themselves. Not, well, you know, if I'm strong enough, I won't let myself be tempted. And if I find I'm being tempted, I'll break away, you know. No, no, that's already going too far. <clears throat> if they just ask themselves, is this appropriate for me to be here in your house this late at night? <clears throat> Unchaperoned, just alone. Not only in terms of what temptation might come to us, but even as, in terms of what other people reasonably might, might think. What kind of scandal might we be given? They even want to want to avoid even giving bad impressions or false impressions of other people because they realize they have a responsibility. <clears throat> they would appreciate that later when they have children and they are concerned about their children being scandalized by the behavior of others. Well, it starts with them when they're courting. They have to realize, okay, we have to avoid giving scandal in the way we're courting too, by right? in inappropriate behavior with each other, inappropriate contact, inappropriate comments, and so on. It, we should just rule this out. So that's one feature of their courting process. <clears throat> but the church says that um, obviously, for a man and a woman to uh, to marry, they have to they should know each other, and they should know each other's character more than anything. You know, nowadays, unfortunately, that that uh, is translated into something very earthy and very uh, vulgar, that knowledge of each other, and very impure. And so that's really the essential feature of their marriage. They want to make sure they're marrying somebody they can have fun with. Uh, those, those are not, those, those are disastrous. They, they always end in disaster. That's what they're looking for. Um, that's what's first and foremost in their minds. They're, they're abominable in God's, God's eyes from the very beginning. <clears throat> they're not going to preserve their integrity to their marriage day, thinking like that. But um, they they have to um, uh, think in, in terms of the long-term vocation they have and realize that the powers that are given, the reproductive powers that are given, male and female, draws them together, are given in the service of God giving life. <clears throat> And this is not just something involved. God did not give them these powers just for the sake of having fun. God did not give them the mutual attraction for the sake of allowing, having them just enjoying each other's company. There's, that's not a vocation. That's self-indulgence. Father, you, you mentioned that, that the church has, uh, has, has established some rules concerning dating. Has, has she ever spoken anything concerning the... The length of, of the courtship, because it seems that, that nowadays uh, very very long and extended courtships seem to be the norm, and there seems to be many cases where, uh, say, a Catholic couple will, will meet each other in high school, they'll begin dating in high school, they will uh, date throughout college, they don't want to get married yet until they finish college, but even then after college, often one of them will go on to graduate school, or they'll say, I want to uh, wait, pay off some of my student loans, get in a more comfortable financial position, and so it's just you have these extremely long extended periods of dating. Has the church ever said anything about that? She has condemned the over long extended periods of dating. And nowadays it seems that everything is uh, militating against the church's understanding of courtship and marriage. The church thinks in terms of six months to a year. <clears throat> six months being on the short side, if that's enough for a, a man and a woman to get to know each other well enough, yeah. to know each other's character, to believe that this is the man, this is the one I, I know will be a, make a good husband and a good father, a good wife and a good mother. To reach that conviction and have a reasonable certitude of that, six months really? is reasonable. And a year, when it goes beyond a year, it's considered by the church to be in the danger zone. Because there you find people, uh, find their relationship can seem to go kind of stale. 
unless, and that's where the temptations come in to say, okay, now we have to keep a certain interest going. <clears throat> and the temptations come in to start doing things that they really uh, cannot do. Um, things that will destroy their, the true love. And so it seems like it's giving an opening to Satan to get in there and to say, okay, in order to keep the, 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 uh, uh, the interest going here, we're going to have to start doing things that are sinful. And that's, that's, that's tragic. If there ever was any true love there, that will destroy it, uh, and rapidly destroy any true love. So the church is very clear on that. But unfortunately, the society we live in today uh, wants to get young people into debt. <clears throat> And it wants to prevent them from becoming financially independent. I mean, this is one thing that is absolutely essential for a man to marry a woman and raise a family. They have to have the financial um, uh, foundation in place. And now it's very difficult for a young man to get into that position. Uh, the, the idea, the whole idea seems to be to, to get them into massive debt and keep them there. Yeah. Um, so... You know, there are those who warn against these uh, government loans, uh, student loans, and so on, and I can understand why. Uh, they're kind of a modern-day slavery. And, um, but one thing's for sure, when you have the, the debt of student loan, it makes it very, very difficult to get on your financial feet strong enough to actually take responsibility and support, support a family. Um, but this is what any man who wants to marry and have a family has to keep in mind. The church is very strong on this point, that the man is the provider. God has designed it that way. That the man is the provider in the sense that he brings um, <clears throat> home the, uh, the bacon, uh, <clears throat> the mastodon, the money, whatever it is, uh, to provide the... the, the uh, material for, for the material welfare of the family and um, the woman in her own in her own right she's designed by God to nurture those children in a way that no one else can and uh, so the husband is the man who has to make that possible um, this puts a very serious um, burden on the husband on the man's shoulder uh, to prove also, that he can be a good provider, and he can be a provider who is skillful enough and uh, and uh, sufficient to allow the mother to be a mother to her children when they need her the most in those early years. Well, Father, this is perhaps the, the final question on this topic, but if there is a Catholic couple who has been dating, let's say they reach that, that six-month mark, how do they know if they are ready to take the next step? and go ahead and propose and uh, proceed with the marriage? Well, uh, of course, you know, I'll start with prayer again. I have to pray a great deal. I should pray not only with each other, they should pray for each other, okay? Uh, they, they really need to do both. And, uh, but they need to look for God's guidance here. Right? They should also consult others who love them. You know, a, a man or a woman uh, thinking of marriage, uh, not only, well, the decision to marry, choose the married vocation, is one decision. The decision to marry a particular person is another independent decision, okay? And so uh, parents cannot make the choice for the offspring whether they will marry or not. They can't just dictate to a child, a son or a daughter, you're getting married. That's your, I'm, I'm demanding that you get married because I'm giving you that vocation. The vocation comes from God. Um, but they should definitely um, have a say in who their son or daughter marries. In other words, the son or the daughter should have enough respect for his own mother and father to want to know their assessment of the man or the woman they're looking to marry. <clears throat> because It's not just a matter of the son or the daughter uniting with another person and starting a family of their own. The um, we're talking about the grandparents of the of their children, and we're talking about actually bringing another son or another daughter into the family, as they say. So any son or daughter who has any real respect for a mother or father will consult them on that matter, 
In the old days, the man would the 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 would be groom would go to the father and ask for his daughter's hand in marriage. It's a matter of respect. And really, what he's asking to do is, uh, I, I am actually wanting to become a member of the family. And uh, and the father of the bride should actually have, he has an interest and an important role to play in that. Okay. Uh, hopefully. The, the bride or the groom's mother married well and brought a man <laughs> into the family that uh, this is respectable and commands enough respect to draw that, that uh, from any would-be suitor for his daughter or any uh, potential bride for, his, for their son. Um, but the... Um, that, that's a factor that is they're very, very important. And um, not just to consult friends, but friends who are intelligent, happily married, themselves perhaps, to get good advice. They really need to get good advice. Now, maybe they'll get to the six-month mark and they haven't really gotten to know the other person well enough. Mm -hmm. And if they just have the sense, well, I don't really know, that there are still too many unknowns about this person's character. And they, they can ask themselves, well, how would this person react if this, and how would this person react if that? What would they say about this, or what would they say about this? Maybe they don't have the answers they need. There are so many things, uh, that ha questions that have to be addressed um, when you're considering a spouse. I mean, how responsible are they uh, financially? Are they spendthrifts? Are they misers? Do they throw money away on frivolous, useless things? Will they not even spend money on necessary and important things? Um, are they, are they uh, obsessing about uh, making money at all costs in any way they can? Um, and uh, this is, these are just a few of the questions. Is this person really, does this person have the educational background or do they have the skills necessary to earn the money to support the family? But then even if they do have the skills and the education necessary, do they have the drive, the do they have the... Uh, um, the necessary fortitude to actually go and find a job and accept the responsibility, or are they lazy and they expect me to do things for them? Does this man uh, take the initiative, or does he sit back and, and want me to do it for him? Well, what kind of a husband is he going to be for our family? Where is the leadership going to be? Am I the one who's going to eventually be supporting this family while my husband sits home and watches sports on the television? Uh, you know, a bride needs answers to those questions. She needs questions as, does he have a quick temper, right? Um, <clears throat> if, he, if he has a hot temper, how he reacts to me now if I'm late or I burn the toast or, or whatever, and, uh, keep him waiting and so on. I mean, what, what am I going to be dealing with there? Unfortunately, I, I hear a lot uh, from people these days about what they call narcissistic temperaments or narcissistic characters, narcissistic personalities. Maybe you've heard something about these things. Well, uh, there seem to be a, a, a lot of people these days who uh, fit the category or married someone they think fits the category, right? Um, yeah, but really, when you get right down to it, narcissism is original sin manifesting itself and very boldly and blatantly, right? So... Um, one, one needs to know uh, whether it's at the six-month mark, at the nine-month mark, whatever it is, you know, you can't really schedule these things. One needs to know the answers to certain very important questions. And um, that's where the priest comes in, to help them get those answers and add, tell them, these are the things you probably need to find out. If you don't know them yet, you need to find out about this person. And um, talk to your friends, talk to your circle of friends, find out their impressions of, you know, this person. Talk to his circle of friends. Get to know who are the people he's friends with. What kind of friends are they? What do his connections tell you about his character? Above all, uh, pray to the Holy Ghost for guidance mm -hmm. uh, to know uh, what you need to know about this person and how to find that out and then the grace to accept it, God's will. Knowing this, you have to have that intention that if you do get to the altar and you do make the marriage vows, you are going to keep them. 
and you want to be sure to marry someone who also will keep those vows. Be faithful to you and to God. Well, Father, I think we can end with that. It was another uh, lengthy program, but I think we we got there a lot. We covered a lot of ground. I think it was very practical, very helpful. So I well, thank I you, so, Father. Too. Appreciate so, your time. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Thanks to all of our viewers as well for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady at Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and finally to pray and do penance. Thank you, and God bless you.